of the Ohio School of Economics uh, will talk about supervised classification of Cox process trajectories. Thank you very much for the introduction. So, uh, as a freshly recruited member of uh, this institution, I would like to say that I'm very happy to have a, an occasion to speak uh, right upon my arrival. So, today I will be talk talking about uh, one of the last topics I've, uh, I've I studied during my PhD thesis. So this is a joint work uh, with uh, Professor Gerard Bio, who is a professor at Paris East, and uh, Benoit Cadre, who was one of my two supervisors uh, in Ernest Anne. So uh, in, this, uh, in this contribution, we, we had two objectives. The first one was to study uh, the, the problem of supervised classification in a particular functional context, which is a <coughs> the context of counting processes. And our second uh, objective was to uh, provide a classification rule which is actually computable, uh, more precisely, which is constructed via uh, convex uh, minimization procedure. So, roughly speaking, our, uh, the, the, the data we want to consider in this classification problem is the following. We consider and trajectories of counting processes, say on 0, 1, for simplicity. And we suppose that each trajectory is labeled. So we focus here on a binary classification where we have only two classes. So each trajectory is labeled by, say, plus 1 or minus 1. So here, uh, an example of uh, application, and what we had in mind, is the following. Say, for instance, that you observe uh, on one year the number of visits uh, to the hospital of some patients that uh, have, uh, say, uh, cancer. And uh, for each of those patients, uh, we have the trajectory and also we have a diagnostic indicating if after one year uh, their disease has been aggravating or has uh, become better. And now our goal is uh, to have a we have a new trajectory, so a new patient is observed during one year, and based on our uh, learning data, we want to be able to affect the label or uh, an automatic diagnostic of his uh, of his um, the evolution of the disease. So, before getting into the details of the model we consider and uh, our contribution, uh, as I figured that the audience is uh, quite uh, composed of. Uh, very eminent scientists, but from uh, a broad, uh, broad areas, I, I, I thought that making a small introduction in supervised classification would be interesting. Just to remind the notations. So, what is classification? Supervised classification. So, the the classical setting is the following: we assume that we are given a, a sample of labeled, uh, independent, and identically distributed data. So the data points are the xi's, the labels are the yi's. And we'll suppose that they are distributed uh, along the same distribution and a, 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 a certain, uh, uh, how do you call it, universal or uh, well, xy just for notations. And the general goal is uh, to give a new data point xn plus 1, whose label is unknown, drawn from the same distribution as capital X, we would like to determine its label, unknown label, Xn plus 1, uh, in a, in a, with minimum uh, probability of error. And what we mean formally by that is the following. So we want to construct formally a classification rule, which is a, a function Gn, uh, taking its arguments in the data, in the data space X, with values plus or minus 1. And based on, uh, based on our sample, so we, the small n here uh, indicates that Gn is actually a, it's actually a random variable taking its uh, values in a function space. So based on our sample, such that the probability of error of Gn is as small as possible. So another way of understanding this quantity, of course, is that L of Gn is simply the indicator function of y is different from gn of x integrated against 
the joint distribution next one. Okay. So, uh, so now the question uh, is, is uh, of course, yeah. So how do we measure the performance of a given rule? So usually uh, we, we, we choose to measure the performance of a given rule GN by comparing its performance at L of GN to the so-called base risk or that we denote L star that is simply the minimal, uh, the minimal probability of error that is possible where here the infimum is taking over all the possible functions with values of plus or minus one. So in other words, what we are want to do is try to bound, so in a certain sense, with high probability or an expectation, the positive random quantity which is here. So of course this is positive because by definition L star is uh, smaller than its quantity. So, of, so this is of course uh, an objective that is typical of the learning, statistical learning framework because our objective is not to estimate uh, uh, the, the best possible rule, I'll explain that, but mimic the performance of the best possible rule. So uh, just, uh, this is, will be interesting for the, the sequel. So we can show that uh, actually the best possible rule, so-called Bayes rule, can, is given explicitly by this formula. Uh, it's precisely uh, actually the sign, it's, this is the sign of the regression function of y given x. So now, the question is how to construct a rule GN uh, whose performance is good. So of course there are a lot of uh, possi possible uh, ways to do that. I just mentioned two. Uh, so example one uh, is the so-called nearest neighbors uh, rule. One of, maybe one, one of the most natural ways to construct uh, a classification rule and it, it is constructed as follows. So GN of x, uh, I just put nn for nearest neighbor is simply uh, constructed as as, follow, as, uh, as follows. So, gn of x given a, a data point a small x, it's uh, plus one if a majority of x size in the k nearest neighbors of x have level plus one, minus minus one otherwise. So k has to be chosen in, in advance. So. There's no much room here, I'm afraid you won't see, but what this simply means is that if you have label, label points in the, in the plane, for, for instance, you have, okay, so you have triangles and circles, and now you, uh, let's put more data points. Okay, so these are labeled data points, and now you have a new data point then you want to label it, and if you choose k equals 2, you take the two uh, small, uh, closest neighbors to this point, so these ones. So here the majority vote indicates that uh, most of the, of course here most of the neighbors are round, so you decide that this point is actually round. So the, this uh, quite natural rule is, has nice properties in, in the Euclidean framework, and it's actually, uh, one of its properties is that it is universally weakly consistent in the following sense. So if uh, round x is Rd, and suppose the number of neighbors k, depending on n, has this uh, asymptotic, so it's growing to infinity with n, but uh, slower, slower than n. Uh, then, uh, for any distribution of the random couple x, y, you have that this quantity uh, converges to the base, uh, the base, rule, base risk. Actually, uh, improvements of this result have been obtained, of course, in, the, in particular, uh, Luc de Broglie and co-authors uh, showed in 1994 that it's uh, strongly consistent in the sense that we take out the expectation here and this converges almost surely for any distribution. So I just gave, gave this for a, a, an introduction, and there is a very nice uh, result. So here, in our contribution, we will talk about function, the functional context. And so as a, an introduction and a base for discussion after, uh, I just introduced the result. So there's a very nice result uh, for the nearest neighbor rule uh, when you want to extend it in a, 
infinite uh, dimensions. So it's a sufficient condition for um, for uh, for consistency. Actually, it's weak consistency. Sorry, I should have written weak consistency in the previous sense. So the result is the following. Uh, suppose x t is a, a separable metric space. Also, the simplicity that we will put it. Then the nearest neighbor rule is consistent if the following condition is satisfied. So this is usually referred to as the Bezikovich uh, condition. And roughly speaking, this condition is, uh, okay, so R is the, here is the regression function of Y given X. So this, it's not really clear what it means, but in fact, it's a pretty much a continuity property of the regression function with respect to the marginal distribution of X. So of course, if R is a continuous function, this is all automatically satisfied. And you have a, a number of interesting, well, uh, up to my knowledge, open questions. Uh, so this is only a, a, a sorry, a, a necessary condition, a sufficient condition. Sorry. So, but what does what happens when X is, for instance, a, a standard Brownian motion or a Brownian diffusion? Is this condition satisfied? Uh, in the case where x is a point or a counting process, and what about rates of convergence? So here, uh, these questions, which are uh, I believe not trivial, uh, indicate that general, or at least direct generalization of the nearest neighbor on infinite dimension is probably not a good idea. For instance, uh, it is. Uh, I guess a uh, pretty much uh, active field of research. What is this? What is the behavior of this quantity? Uh, uh, sorry, B x delta just uh, refers to the open. Of course, B x delta refers to the closed ball of center x and radius delta in the metric space. So, what is the the, the behavior of this quantity when x is a ground in motion? I guess this is one of uh, interesting question today, which is not totally solved. So, without making uh, ad hoc, this was uh, this for the nearest neighbor. This yeah, what yeah. is what is k? K is k is the number of neighbors that you choose. Yeah, but is it fixed or, or no? It, it moves. I'm sorry. Yeah, but so it is. Yeah. It's, you know, it has this is a something k depends on. So the then, then the result is for all the nearest neighbors that this this property. Exactly. They, they are yeah. Exactly. So this wasn't very clear. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, without making ad hoc uh, 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 assumptions on the behavior of the small balls in infinite dimension, uh, using direct generalization of a finite dimensional method is not always a good idea. Maybe we should use the particular uh, functional uh, structure of the data each time we consider a specific example. So now let's go to the second example, very famous, well, widely studied at least, which is the so-called empirical risk minimization rule. So uh, this rule is constructed also in a very natural way. It is uh, just the empirical counterpart of the definition of the Bayes rule. Actually, the Bayes rule minimizes this quantity when uh, here is not the uh, when we here it's not the empirical measure we consider, but the actually true distribution of the random couple. And here we just decide to replace this unknown uh, distribution by the empirical measure. So this classifier or combined with this classification rule is constructed by minimizing this uh, criterion given uh, a prescribed class G round of uh, classification rules. So uh, the performance of this classifier or classification rule depends essentially on the, the complexity, a certain measure of the complexity of this class of function G. And roughly speaking, what we can show, just to have a, a broad idea of the type of results, is that the behavior or the performance of this classifier is given by, uh, is a big O of uh, this quantity, which is square root of log n over n. And here, this quantity V of G uh, stands for the Vatnik, Vatnik, so called Vatnik Javonekis dimension of G, which is, uh, we could maybe speak about that at the end, which is a kind of 
Um, uh, uh, sorry, I'm looking for my words. A kind of measure of complexity of the class G. So, of course, a lot of improvements have been. Uh, let, let's talk about other uh, contributions. So, general references of um, surveys and classification, um, supervised classification, sorry, uh, can be found in the famous book by De Roy, Gioffi, and Lugosi. More recently, Lugosi gave a very nice survey uh, of recent developments in the, the context. So now classification in a functional context is not a new topic, of course. Uh, you have very nice uh, reference books by Ramsey and Silverman, written in 97 and 2002. Hasti and Tipshirani also have proposed a very nice contribution. And Vio, Vinia, Wekamp and other, uh, other uh, authors have also very nicely contributed to the topic. I would like to make a small comments on this, uh, these contributions. So uh, a general observation that we can do today uh, uh, concerning uh, classification in the functional context is the following. So you have one, once uh, it's, it's very uh, obvious in, for example, this, uh, the contribution of Bio Binaire Wekamp and Ralph St. Silverman. So what authors uh, like to do sometimes is to consider the the, for instance, the classification problem in the, say, the Hel uh, Helberg spec context, and the lack of structure somehow in this uh, very general space uh, forces, uh, forces us to replace the full representation of data by uh, truncated, uh, uh, truncated development in a given Helberg basis, and actually results in performance of uh, performance of rules that we construct by this method actually suffer in a quite, uh, quite uh, artificial way. They suffer by the number of uh, co coefficients that we choose to, to keep. And this is actually a, a bit uh, a problem because we don't use the functional, uh, we don't actually use the functional uh, nature of the, of the data. So now other improvements in another framework, which is the uh, empirical risk minimization framework, can be found in, in these, uh, in these uh, contributions. So there is a, a nice uh, contribution by Mamen and Sibakov uh, using the so-called um, low noise assumption and that achieved fast rates. And of course, you, uh, further developments can be found in the following, uh, following contributions. So now let's uh, let's get back to our problem. So what we want to do is the following: we observe labeled trajectories of counting processes, and now uh, which are labeled, and now we want to construct the classification rules with, which gives labels to unlabeled trajectories with minimum prob probability of error. So let's get a bit in more details to the model we consider. So the first question we, we want to ask is the following. How can we model the distribution of a counting process, X, with la fixed label? So I hope everybody can see at least a bit this part of the, the board. So we consider, so remind, let us remind that the, the, the kind of application we have that we have uh, in mind is the number of visits of patients to a hospital. So this is an increasing quantity. Okay, so this is the, the type of data we consider. So some some trajectories are labeled. Okay, so you have green and blues. Let's say that the blues are plus one. And the green or minus one. Now we have unlabeled ones. Okay. This one, we don't know. So now if you want to model the, the distribution of uh, a random variable taking values in the green trajectories, for instance, then uh, there's an observation that should be made. This 
this model should take uh, in a, should should, uh, should incorporate uh, the dependent on, on certain parameters or covariable z. Let me explain. For instance, if you observe a trajectory which is which seems to be jumping more and more often, and keep in mind the example of the hospital. So if you have a trajectory jumping more and more often, this means that the patient is coming more and more often into the hospital. So how to decide? Is, is this a patient who, uh, whose illness is becoming more and more problematic? Or is it just somebody who's just very scared about his, uh, his, uh, his, uh, about his uh, physical state? It's not very obvious. But if you incorporate the information that this guy is actually very uh, worried about his health, this helps you to, to actually interpret the, the curve. So a nice way to, to incorporate additional information, like I mean, age, distance from the hospital, is the guy uh, anxious or not, is to consider the following model. So this model prescribes to consider that given a certain function a lambda plus, so this is determining deterministic function, the law of the jump of the counting process x given z, z is that of a Poisson process of intensity a lambda plus of z to t. Okay, in other words, we assume here that x is a Cox process of random intensity lambda plus of z t. So now, of course, we don't have, uh, x doesn't take only its values in the green curves, but also in the blue ones. So now, second question, how to construct our final model. How can we model the distribution of the counting process with unlabeled, uh, with a fixed label? So this is very natural, given what we just said. If x is a counting process, is our counting process, z is our covariate, and y is the label, then the very natural uh, procedure is to consider that x is a mixture. So given two functions now, lambda plus and lambda minus, we consider the law of x, given z and the fact that y equals plus one, say, then it is the, uh, the Poisson process with intensity lambda plus of the t. So I'm just saying here that x, for us, in an older sequel, will be the mixture of two Cox processes with a different intensity. So let's go to our uh, classification problem. So now our, uh, it, our learning sample will not only be consisted of, uh, so it will be just as before, but the, the, so the only little difference is that our, our data points are pairs, pairs of trajectories. X is the trajectory of the counting process, Z is the trajectory of, uh, so say the covariates that we want to consider for the patient, and Y is the, the label. And our goal, I'm just repeating uh, what we said, but with new notations and our new context. So we, we want to find a classification rule, GM, taking in values in one, minus one, plus one, uh, such that the, its probability of error is uh, close to the base risk given by this quantity, where, again, the uh, L star uh, is, is given by L of G star, where G star is the base rule given explicitly here. So our first contribution in this, uh, our first result in this contribution is uh, an ex uh, explicit expression of the Bayes rule. Uh, that is the explicit expression of the best possible rule. So denoting by plus, by p plus and minus these quantities, what we show is that the a posteriori, uh, a posteriori distribution here it is given explicitly by p plus over p minus exponential minus c plus p plus, where c is this quite a uh, horrible quantity. So here uh, we see that uh, appears the two uh, functions lambda minus and lambda plus, which are the deterministic uh, functions that we have chosen to describe our model. Zs is the covariate, and xs is the actually trajectory of our process. And in particular, this we can we can uh, easily derive by this expression the explicit form of our uh, debate rule. 
So the ideas for the proof here, uh, it's one of the original uh, aspects of this work, is that it's actually a real, based on a, a st quite standard um, stochastic uh, calculus arguments, namely the Gerson of theorem and the multiple properties of the Poisson processor. And uh, basically, the, the proof here is uh, pretty much written along the same lines than the proof showing that um, the, the law of uh, Brownian diffusion is uh, absolutely continuous with respect to the linear measure. So now, uh, let's get to, so this is just a theoretical result with, with no, for the moment, no big, uh, in, no big interest since we, of course, we don't know the law of Z and X and we want to cons construct uh, uh, um, we want to construct um, this uh, classification rule whose performance mimics the performance of G star. So let's have a small talk about empirical risk minimization. So we all already mentioned this, uh, this very natural method. So this uh, method prescribes to follow the following strategy. So consider the empirical probability of error of a given uh, classification rule G. Then, given a certain class of function G round, choose uh, the function G n as an element who's minimizing this empirical probability of error. So, of course, this has very nice uh, theoretical guarantees, but unfortunately, from a from a practical point of view, uh, as you can see. Uh, the mi minimization of Ln is actually a non-complex problem because of the indicator function, and this is uh, so. This is not really uh, so. unless uh, the class on which you're minimizing is very trivial. This is not a very nice uh, computational problem. Actually, it poses several very serious numerical problems, and this is uh, very nicely discussed in the following contribution. So now. A very natural idea to, to treat this problem, knowing that the fact the problem here comes from the non convexity of the criterion to minimize. A very natural, uh, a very natural uh, way to solve the problem would be to replace this criterion by a convex one, which is in some sense quite close. So, this is precisely the goal of what is called boosting, which I will expose right now. So. The, the idea of boosting is the following, is to construct a classification rule through this time a convex minimization procedure and the strategy is the following. So now take, so now take a convex function phi with positive values, take a class uh, big F of uh, so-called generalized classification rules F uh, so I'm calling that generalized classification rules because this time they don't take values plus and minus one if they take any re possible real value then compute uh, the function fn which minimizes this criterion an given here and explain why this is interesting and then simply take gn as the sign of this function so this is a, a totally convex procedure okay as you can see uh, this criterion, phi being a convex function, and here we just have a sum, this criterion uh, depends uh, in a convex way with, with f. The dependency on f is convex, so we can, uh, we can actually solve this problem depending on the complexity of f. And of course, taking the sign of the solution doesn't cost much at all. So now the question is, is why does this work? So, I would like maybe to show that on a, on a picture. So let me try to explain on a small drawing why this works. Because uh, on the first look, I'm not sure that this is very clear. So what we want to do is the following. Suppose for, I'm, doing, I'm, I'm looking at an extremely stupid case, but you have only one data point. So here our data point consists in the trajectory, one trajectory of our counting process, one trajectory of the, the 
the covariate that we consider that is uh, depends on the patient, and why the label, and it's given. And now you have only two classification rules, generalized classification rules. values in R. And uh, you want to decide which is the best one. So suppose, without knowing, suppose, sorry, that you, the sign of, uh, sign of, sorry, the sign of F1 of XZ is actually equal to minus Y. And sign of F2 of XZ is plus one. So you see here the, 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 the function F, which is actually the best one, the one that gives the right label, is, is, the first, is F2. Okay? F2 is the best. In the very simple class F1, F2. So, this being said, you can notice, so of course this is an information that we don't have, but you can notice the following. If you take the function phi as the exponential, for instance, then here you have uh, minus y f2 x z here minus y f1 x z and then it is clear by the, the drawing that f2 is actually minimizing over the class f1 f2 the quantity phi of minus y f x z so this is maybe not very uh, clear on the first look it's actually a very uh, I don't see if every, I don't think everybody sees what's written in the word maybe it's clear okay so this this simple observation actually when you generalize it you get the the general formulation of the blue statement okay so now more specifically, you can give the relationship that exists between performance of this rule by the following. This is the first observation that we make. If we denote by big A this convex criterion, we've just seen the empirical counterpart. What has been recently shown, quite recently, uh, in 2006 actually, is that under very mild uh, uh, assumptions on the Convex function phi, namely that is non decreasing and having a strictly positive derivative in the origin, then the function f star, which minimizes this convex criterion, is actually such that the sign of this quantity is precisely, uh, in some sense, precisely the base, the base rule. So actually, what this is saying is that uh, it is completely reasonable to try to approximate the base rule, which is in some sense our goal, by taking the sign of a function that is approximating f star. And this is, uh, approximating f star is quite nice now, but because we can replace a by the empirical counterpart, and this is a convex criterion. So more precisely what we can show in, pr uh, in practice, uh, what I mean, what I, in practice I mean for practical choices of the function phi. What we can show is that it, there exists a uh, constant C and S such that we have the contr this control uh, here. Okay, so in all the rest of my talk I will denote GN the sign of Fn. Fn being the function that minimizes the convex criterion that we have just seen. So now, uh, these are examples of function phi that are chosen in the literature. So the, maybe the function exponential and log it. And for those both cases, we have this uh, precise control. 
And one may, may think, okay, we have replaced a non-convex criterion in the usual uh, context by a convex one, but now we have a square root here. So maybe we're losing a lot in terms of uh, rate of convergence. In fact, what we can show is that uh, the quantity which is under the root here actually converges extremely fast in some cases. And uh, as a result, we actually do not uh, uh, lose any, anything in terms of rates of convergence. So in order to see code, this is the choice we will make. Uh, I could talk about the reason why, but maybe this is not really interesting for this, uh, this talk. I will skip the details. And now, so as we've seen, what we need to do is cho choose a function phi, convex function. That is what we just, we just exposed our choice. And now we have to choice, choose a, a class of function big F on which we will proceed to our minimization procedure. So in this slide, I would just like to roughly give a flavor of the reason why we have done the choice that I will expose right right after. So let us make an observation. So take a certain class of function phi j uh, such that the two functions that are here uh, that appeared in the base, uh, the definition of uh, the expression of the base rule that we have obtained. And suppose that in, the, in this class of function, those two functions have uh, an expansion. Then uh, just uh, Roughly speaking, when you just uh, put this expression in the expression of psi that we have obtained, then you just have that, and the form of the base rule becomes the following, where the function big phi and big psi, big phi and big psi are given here, in red and, 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 red and green. So, this general form that we obtain here, indicates the following thing. So remember that we have we want to mimic the behavior of the function g star, which is unknown. This representation tells us the following. If we want to mimic g star, it is quite natural to try to mimic it by the sign of a function which mimics or that resembles to something he, uh, that is under the sign. So something that uh, is close to the function that is under the sign is very naturally a uh, partial sum. And of course, uh, here we don't know this p plus and p minus, so, but we might want to, to replace this by constants which approximate it. So the very, this quite na natural uh, reasoning brings us to this, the following choice. So now, given a, a fixed family of function, this is chosen by the statistician actually, for, uh, say, for approximation properties of this base, uh, this base class. Well, I'll get to it after. So for a given choice of this family, and for a given integer uh, capital B, we define big F of B, so this class depends on B, as uh, the partial sums of the functions that we introduced just before, uh, plus constants, where the coefficients are controlled in L11. Uh, so there are two, things, two uh, remarks we can make. Here, the parameter B, stems as a, a kind of regular, regularization parameter in the sense that the, the, the greater B is and the, the, the more, uh, the, more um, the more precise the class FB is, is in terms of approximation but uh, the bigger it is and, and uh, in converse it, it's going to make a big sorry, B is big then the minimization procedure is going to be complicated. So we have to find B uh, satisfying a certain trade-off. And the second uh, observation that we can make is that here we have decided to extend those two functions. So this might not appear weird to some of you, but uh, actually this, this could be an interesting question because uh, this is not very natural to expand those two functions and not one could say why don't you expand lambda minus and lambda plus that would be a legit, legitimate question and the reason why we do this is because with this expansion uh, our class of function actually depends linearly on coefficients and otherwise if we had expanded the lambda plus and lambda minus and because of the log here we wouldn't have, we would, we wouldn't have had uh, a linear a linear uh, dependency 
on the coefficients, and therefore the convex criterion would, would not have depend convexly on the, I'm not sure it's on the coefficients. I'm not sure that's very clear, but that's the reason why. So now, I said that we have to choose the, the, the parameter beta, introduced here, in a way to balance two problems, the, the size of uh, the class FB and the approximation properties of this class. So a very natural way to do this is the following. You take an increasing sequence of parameters beta, and for each value of this parameter beta, you find uh, an estimator which minimizes the criterion over this class. Now, take a penalty function, uh, certain penalty function pen that we will, uh, we will ex express its, uh, its form after. And I choose Fn, our final uh, general, generalized classification rule, as the estimator f hat of k hat, where k hat is actually uh, taken so as to uh, balance the, the size of the class fbk and the, uh, the approximation properties of this class. So maybe this is not very familiar to most of, of you, but let's go quickly to the performance of such a uh, classification rule. So actually, if uh, on some restrictions on the, the growth of the parameters beta, uh, what we can show is that if the penalty function is essentially taken bigger than bk to the power 4 log n over n, then what we can show is the following inequality. So a nice way to read this inequality is the following way. What it says is actually that for any value of k, our generalized classification rule here is behaving almost, because of number two, almost as good as the best function in FBK up to a certain uh, uh, up to a certain uh, uh, numerical rest or error, and uh, what we could say uh, with high probability. So what we could say here, first observation, is that if for, if for some value of k, the ideal function f star is actually an fbk, then this term becomes zero, okay? And therefore, this quantity here goes to zero at the rate n of k, which is given here, which is essentially of uh, order log n over n. This is, this is the first observation. Actually, you see, there is no dependency on any dimension at all, or something like that. But of course, this information I just said, that the function f star is, is in some function in bk, is never available. So uh, what we have to do now is to control this bias term. And this is done, uh, actually, in a quite natural way, by imposing some regularity assumptions on the functions intensity functions entering in our model. And this is a simple way of stating the, the result. So if now the functions pj's are the orthonormal basis, and if we assume uh, that the coefficient in the expansion of, of those two functions satisfy this condition, this is actually saying that those two functions are uh, regular enough. Uh, then there exists a certain function, a certain constant, C, that we can express uh, explicitly, uh, for which the bias term for any value of B is of the order uh, capital B to the power of beta over 2. So now, putting together this, the two last results, what we show is actually the following result. So for a, a good choice of the parameters beta and for a certain value of delta will forget delta for the moment, uh, then the performance of our generalized classification rule f n is the following. It goes to zero, uh, so the performance goes to the ideal performance to zero at the, the rate log n over n to the power of beta over beta plus eight. So uh, the most important and the final result that we, we consider here is of course the, what was our main objective, taking by gn the sign of function fn, what we show is that we have constructed a rule 
a binary renewal for classification in this functional context, which goes to the ideal uh, performance at this rate. So more than the specific form of the rate we have here, which is uh, actually I don't have much to say about the exponent that we have here. That depends on the, on the regularity beta of the intensity process, uh, intensity function. Sorry. The most important thing here is that we are in the, uh, in a functional framework, and actually we have obtained rates of convergence that are actually almost comparable to the finite dimensional context. And furthermore, the, the rates we have obtained here adapt automatically to the unknown value of beta, which is the regularity of the intensity process. And this is quite a nice, uh, a nice uh, feature of the, the method. So just to sum up, what we have uh, studied here is uh, supervised classification in a specific functional data. So this work, in this work, we have tried to exploit the functional nature of the, the, data, the, the problem uh, through stochastic calculus arguments. Our rule, our cl classification rule, is obtained through a convex procedure, so it is actually uh, um, it is actually uh, feasible on a computer. And the rates of convergence that we have obtained are pretty much uh, comparable to the finite dimensional context, and they are adaptive to the unknown regularity of the functions lambda plus and lambda minus in the model. And that is the end of my talk. But thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the presentation. Are there questions? Just, just a thought. So the, the rate is optimal, or I mean, the uh, we we have no idea for lower bounds in this functional context. Uh, it would it is a very interesting question to know if this if this is optimal, but we have no benchmark to to compare it to because this is uh, we are in infinite dimensions. Mm -hmm. So in, the, in finite dimensions, uh, we have everything we want. Actually, in the, we know how sharp are the results. And we actually have had sharp results in lower bounds. But in this context, up to my knowledge, uh, uh, we, we have tried to obtain lower bounds with no success at the moment. And uh, I have no idea if this is sharp or not. But in principle, it is possible to, I mean, to Use sub, look for some sub problems to 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 know yeah, yeah, so of so course. Yeah. For instance, I have uh, I've looked at the Poisson process case where it, that is it can be understood as a, as a sub problem, mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, technically it's a bit hard at the moment. Uh, but in principle, of course, we could probably show the whole round. And I mean, there must be also some related papers where uh, we have some functions uh, in this and, and uh, make functional parameters. And is it known what else they are? So, optimally, to compare the similar models, related models. Um, there, some, there must be some dimensionality of the class in the back. Yes, I guess you're, you're right. I have to have a closer look to the literature, but uh, I, will, I have been looking for some some answers, actually, and uh, for the moment I was not very lucky in my research, but uh, I'm sure you have results that could help, uh, of course. Okay, are there some other questions or comments? Question also. So your penalty depends upon some constant. Do you have any idea about choosing this constant numerically or theoretically? Because because otherwise you cannot implement it. I have a, actually I have an expression explicit for the constant, but it's, it's absolutely enormous numerically. Yeah. Absolutely enormous. Yeah. Probably non non practical. Not at all. Okay, well, so let us thank the speaker again. Yeah.